The following program may contain views and opinions which are not necessarily those of the Nine Network or its affiliate stations. It governs what you think. It motivates what you say. It drives everything you do. It's your worldview. This week on Worldview, dispelling the myths of WIC. And we meet a new dynamic duo. Good morning, welcome to Worldview. WIC and Marbo have become an integral part of our language, yet many of us feel misinformed and confused about these legal cases and their consequences. Today then, our program will focus on land rights, trying to distinguish fact and fiction in this jumbled debate. Also this morning, a look at The Peacemaker, an action film starring Nicole Kidman and George Clooney. And later in the program, Doug Drinnan joins us to continue his review of The Ten Commandments. But right now, a look at some of the main events in the news this week. At home this week, tragedy gripped rural New South Wales. 150 fires raged across the state, taking the lives of two firefighters and destroying a dozen homes. 30 to 40 knot winds and extreme temperatures hampered attempts to extinguish the flames. As the country mourned the loss incurred in this tragedy, many reflected on the heroism of the men who gave their lives to help others. Possessions can be replaced, but lives can't. In Canberra, the threat of a double dissolution loomed when independent Senator Brian Harradine blocked the government's WIC bill. Senator Harradine, who holds the balance of power in the upper house, rejected two points in the government's ten-point plan. The proposal to abolish Aborigines' rights to negotiate over pastoral leases and the introduction of a six-year deadline to lodge native title claims. But Prime Minister John Howard refused to back down. And turbulent times on the waterfront this week, the federal opposition claiming that former Australian soldiers are being trained to take the jobs of Union Wharfies. Seventy former soldiers left for the Middle East to undertake three months training in stevedoring, the opposition alleging that when the men return to Australia, they will replace existing workers. Is this the government's approach to industrial relations? Bring in the heavies, bring in the spies, bring in the military types to boot the crap out of all the people on the waterfront? We are uh, recruiting for an overseas consortium to uh, train people overseas for uh, the jobs that we have here in, uh, in Australia. Meanwhile, in Papua New Guinea, Prime Minister Bill Skate used drunkenness as a defence to explain his behaviour on videotapes, revealing him organising bribes and boasting of his power to kill people through gangs. Mr Skate fired his deputy party leader and a former advisor claiming they had set him up. And after the break, a clearer look at land rights. Welcome back to Worldview. Our special report today is on land rights. Ever since native title was first recognised, people have speculated about its impact on other forms of land title. Uncertainty, fear and misinformation have made this complex issue even more difficult to understand. But with a general election on land rights emerging, the need for us to be well informed is also increasing. On the 30th of June 1993, the Wick people made a claim for native title on land in northern Queensland. Their claim was first heard in the federal court where it failed. It was then appealed in the High Court. Here, no decision was reached pertaining to the Wick case, but significantly, four of the seven High Court judges ruled that native title could coexist with pastoral leases granted by the government. Indigenous groups indicated their agreement with the ruling. Others in the rural sector raised concern as to how coexistence could be managed in a practical way. In an attempt to clarify the High Court's ruling and its relationship with current legislation, the government developed a ten-point plan to amend the Native Title Act. The plan has drawn both support and criticism. It was passed by the lower house, but blocked in the federal Senate, by a coalition of Labor, the Democrats and independent MP Brian Harradine, who holds the balance of power. Despite the Prime Minister's urging to resolve the matter swiftly, a deadlock has emerged. Senator Harradine wishes to soften the proposed bill by ensuring that Aborigines have a right to negotiate on pastoral leases and by eliminating the deadline before which native title claims must be lodged. 
But Mr Howard has promised that his government will not back down, raising the spectre of a double dissolution and an election based on race. We've asked Tom Main, an advisor on land rights to the Sydney Anglican Church, to explain the origins and growth of native title legislation. To speak with him is Kel Richards. Tom Main, do the vast majority of Australians understand native title? Well, no, they don't, and uh, possibly they could be forgiven for not understanding it, because it's, um, it's never really been presented to the general public you know, in layman's terms, the way that everybody could understand. Very briefly and very simply, so that even I can understand, what did the High Court decide in the Mabo case? What they decided was, or what they, what they had to look at was whether there was such a thing as native title, communal native title. And so they looked around the world and they looked at Canada and the USA, the Pacific Islands, Zimbabwe and heaps of other places and said, hey, fellas, um, British government seems to have recognised communal native title and it's never been legislatively extinguished. Um, therefore, it hasn't been extinguished here either. Okay. So therefore, the Merriam people who have lived on, the, on these islands for yonks own their land. Then after that, the, the previous government brought in the Native Title Bill, the Native Title Act. What, what did that do? The, the High Court in Mabo didn't, contrary to popular myth, didn't decide what, what was happening on the mainland. I mean, there were no pastoral leases on, on Murray Island for a start. So the government... Of but they the, just decided that the concept of native title was sure, alive in Australia. Sure. So, that, you know, there could have been a, a zillion court cases for the next hundred years on the mainland. So the, the government of the day preempted that and said, well, we've got to do two things. We've got to protect everybody's backyard and we've got to make some sort of um, procedure available so that um, people can claim... Uh, if they have a genuine case, the native title rights. And that's what they did. So they sort of codified it in law, as it were. Yeah. Okay. And the, the Aborigines agreed with the government that because of the Racial Discrimination Act 1975, that they would allow the government to d extinguish their rights over pastoral leases and um, mining leases from 1975 on. Oh, backwards. No, from 1975 to the enactment date of the oh, legislation, which right. was okay. not, um, January 1994. Right, OK, I understand. Everything back from 1975 to 1788 was left to the common law because, um, the, the, in fact, the WIC claim was in the High Court at that time. Already? Already, before the Native Title Act was passed. And so they said, well, we're not going to legislate to extinguish Native Title and pastoral leases because the High Court hasn't said one way or the other. Okay. And that's the way it was left, notwithstanding the preamble, which has confused everybody. The preamble's not law. So what the Native Title Act actually does is to say, here's how to go about making a native title claim. That's, that's, that's right. the kind okay. That's right. Then the Wick case reached a decision before the High Court. Again, nice clear language, even mm -hmm. I can understand, Tom. What did the mm -hmm. High Court judges decide? Well, again, the High Court only answers the question, questions that it's asked. And the question that was asked basically was, were the two um, leases in question, one was the Holroyd pastoral lease over which the, the WIC people had asked the question, the other one was the Mitchelton pastoral lease uh, about which the uh, Toyota people had asked the question. Basically, are these leases exclusive possession? And the High Court, after examining that very carefully, said no. And therefore, because they were not exclusive possession, they, they said that pastoral leases generally do not necessarily extinguish all native title rights and interests. So that means the High Court in effect has said there are, there are four types of land title in Australia. There's crown title, the bits the government owns. There's freehold title, which is what most of us have got. There's leasehold title and there's native title. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I think it's important to understand also that in, in the High Court uh, order, it said that the in the event that there's a conflict of interest between the Aboriginals and the pastoralists, that native, native title must yield or give way to the rights of the pastoralists. Give me a real example of a pastoralist who's had to face a native title claim on their land. Well, the pastoralists in Queensland, West Australia and South Australia who have gone public and said they don't see a problem in coexistence. 
Camilla Cowley is uh, a partialist in Queensland. Uh, she got in her mailbox a letter from an Aboriginal group uh, indicate, or from the Native Title Tribunal indicating that there was a claim over her pastoral lease. Um, she was most um, angered by this and got the support of the Farmers Federation and the United Grazers Association and called a meeting to uh, see what could be done about it. And in the midst of that, an Aboriginal lady in the in the public gallery, I presume, stood up and uh, called for calm and uh, and said, well, you know, let's try and sort this out. Well, uh, notwithstanding that, Camilla Cowley uh, went out from that meeting and uh, eventually found the residence of the Aboriginal group that had lodged the claim, uh, went in to uh, remonstrate with them and walked into the same Aboriginal lady again, who turned out to be her pastoralist herself. And when the two women sat down and talked, uh, Camilla Cowley rapidly discovered that she didn't have anything to worry about. She wasn't going to lose a house or a property. Um, and now she's a leading advocate and goes around the country with people like Noel Pearson uh, supporting Aboriginal coexistence. What about the churches? What role can they play in this? I mean, the, the churches had already played a role, but what role should they be playing? I think the churches have to be um, understanding of both sides. Um, there are pastoralists who need the uh, moral and support of the churches, especially in difficult times of drought. Um, but then they must be a prophetic voice and stand up for justice. And uh, I think the, uh, the church could perhaps play a, a leading role in getting pastoralists and Aboriginal groups together. Uh, while ever they remain in their corners, there'll be division and uh, misunderstanding. If they can come together as Camilla Cowley did with Aboriginal people, I, I believe that half of these problems could be resolved. Tom Main, many thanks. Thank you. If you'd like to respond to today's program, you can do so by phoning free call 1800 64 6494. When we return, Michelle Thomas reviews The Peacemaker. Welcome back. The Peacemaker has all the ingredients of a typical Hollywood action blockbuster. Glamorous stars, suspenseful plot and spectacular effects. In the movie, the United Nations gets help from the White House, with former Batman action stars George Clooney and Nicole Kidman joining forces to save the world from terrorists with weapons of mass destruction. The Peacemaker begins with a Russian train hurtling through the Ural Mountains, loaded with nuclear weapons. Within minutes, terrorists have stolen most of the weapons, the train has smashed into another, and a nuclear bomb has wiped out every living thing in the area. Not bad for starters. The Peacemaker begins as it intends to continue, with spectacular action and a gripping plot. Nicole Kidman plays the pivotal role in the film, adding another name to the growing list of female action stars. She brings a much appreciated intelligence and humanity to the film, while still getting to run with the big boys and play with the guns. Kidman plays Dr Julia Kelly, a nuclear scientist thrown in the deep end as a White House advisor. Her character is loosely based on a real-life scientist who visited Russia and saw some holes in their nuclear safety. The peacemaker is the result of her uh, what-if scenario. This is, this is huge. Dr Julia Kelly, acting chair of nuclear smuggling group. Of course, you know Terry Hamilton, national security advisor. Yes, sir. We met at last year's Christmas party. I'm briefing the president in 35 minutes. I need to explain to him how, with our own start team, there a goddamn accident like this could happen. It wasn't an accident, sir. I'm sorry. We believe that train was carrying SS-18s. SS-18s pencil out at one point safe. What's she saying? Sir, it means if you fire a bullet directly into the warhead, there's less than a one in a million chance of the bomb going the off. The warhead has to be ignited by its own nuclear trigger. Look, would you hold this, please? Here we have the satellite image. This is the two trains approaching, and here's the collision itself. Now check out the field of regard. These two shots are at the same height because they occurred at the same time. Look at the blast. It's two degrees higher, after the satellites passed over. Elapsed time between shots? Uh, between the train wreck and the detonation, four and a half minutes. 
Somebody set that nuclear weapon off. This was a terrorist act. The film teams Kidman up with George Clooney in his first tough guy role since Batman. You may be forgiven for thinking he's still wearing the plastic mask. He's not what you'd call expressive. But he gives his soldier hero character everything he's got in terms of energy and pace. Give me a radio. Cover three, you there? Six. What happened? One assault aircraft is gone. Nine men are dead. Kodorov is dead. And we have recovered eight nuclear warheads in their containers. That's not enough warheads. What? That's not enough warheads. That's not enough damn warheads. Yeah, but once you could say something nice. It was an SS-18, ten warheads, one detonated, eight with you. That leaves one unaccounted for. Come in today. There's somebody alive down here. Hold on a minute. Take this. God damn it. We got a live one, Colonel. Do you speak English? Yes, sir. I went to Harvard. Oh, Crimson! Help me up, please! Where's the other warhead? Please, bring me up! Listen to me very carefully. You are gonna die unless you tell me where the other warhead is. I don't know. He, he took it. He's gone. Who? I don't know his name! After the Russian train disaster, the pair head to Central Europe to try to sort out the baddies from the goodies and save the world in the process. Although that sounds glib, I have to admit I was totally hooked in by the storyline and found there was less of the grating America worship in The Peacemaker than in most international war-type action flicks. Instead, the focus is on the United Nations, the peacemakers of the title. The terrorist gripe is that they cause more harm than good failing to protect the innocent in the process. It's interesting to see a terrorist for once treated less like a crazed warmonger and more like a man who can't control his great pain and rage. At the risk of sounding sexist, the more compassionate nature of this particular action film could be because a woman is behind the camera. The director is Mimi Leader, who caught producer Steven Spielberg's eye through her work on ER. While the peacemaker is a long way from the sentimental hospital halls of ER, there's certainly a more human edge to this film. This is for target acquired 300 meters. Not clean, too many friendlies. Or this is leader, take the shot. It's a trial of the family. Acknowledge, take the shot. I'd call the peacemaker a cut above the average action flick, and I'm giving it seven out of 10. Thanks, Michelle. Coming up after the break, the truth about lies. Welcome back. Over the past few months, we've been reviewing the Ten Commandments, exploring their relevance for us today. This morning, Doug Drinnen takes a look at Command Number Nine. Already into the top of the bestseller list. G'day. I'm a bit of a movie buff, like a lot of people. Recently, I saw the movie Liar Liar with Jim Carrey. Carrey's a character, all right, but you either love him or you hate him. In Liar Liar, Jim Carrey plays a lawyer who is a compulsive liar. His deceit ruins his relationships with his friends, his spouse, and his son, who so wants for his dad to tell the truth. But the tragedy of the movie comes when Carey's character eventually does tell the truth, but this time even his son doesn't believe him. See, eventually lies always catch up with us. I once knew a man who was very popular with people, but when he died, no one came to his funeral. You see, as it turned out, this man was a con man. He passed false checks, defrauded people, and so his popularity went downhill fast and he died a very, very sad man. Then again, there's not one of us that hasn't lied. Even Adam blamed Eve for the apple. So what are the causes for us lying? 
I think lying can be those stories or half-truths that we tell about other people to put them down. We do it in order to make ourselves look good. We often see these sorts of cheap shots in the world of politics. Then there's what I call the cowardly lie. That's the story that's invented to avoid the truth. Like the guy that's late home from work because he stopped at the pub too long and he tells his wife he had a flat tyre. And thirdly, there's the conceited lie. You exaggerate on your resume, take a bit off your golf score or add a little extra detail to your past exploits. The motive here is acceptance. On the surface of it, it looks as if our motive for deception is psychological. But the Bible says something different. There's a scripture that says our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. So how can we change? We would need a new heart, a new nature. Jesus once said, we can't enter the kingdom of God unless we've been born again. In other words, we need a new heart, a new nature. There are three steps in order for a person to be born again. The first one is to admit that you lie, admit that you've sinned and failed God. And secondly, is to confess your sin to God. You see, Christ died for our sins in order that we might be forgiven. And when we confess, he cleanses our heart. He erases the record of our wrongs. He gives us a new start. And the third step is to surrender your life to God. Open your heart up to the Holy Spirit and God gives you his spirit and you become born again. Those three steps, admit your need, confess your sin, surrender your heart to God. Friends, the Bible says, do not lie. And the worst lie that we can ever say is the one we say to ourselves when we say, I don't need God. I'm Doug Drennan, and that's my worldview. Our 1-800 number is designed to be your link back to us. Via the phone, you can make contact with someone who can talk to you about your concerns. When you ring, your call will be taken by a volunteer who's been trained to help. While we may not have all the answers at our fingertips, we will try to put you in contact with someone who does. If you agree, we can take your details and organize for someone in your area to take you through a course called Christianity Explained. There's no cost involved, and you're not put on a mailing list or asked for money at any stage. If you do have questions about Christianity, then don't ignore them. Find out some answers. Call 1-800-64-6494 and have Christianity Explained. Well, that's all from Worldview this morning. But I hope you'll join us for our final program of the year next Sunday morning. I look forward to seeing you then.